Scientific American, he found that chemotherapy drugs benefit at most 5%, 1 out of 20, of the cancer patients they're given to. If conventional therapy has such limited results, why isn't the medical profession willing to investigate alternative approaches? The answer to this question may be found in some historic events that took place almost a century ago, when official medicine finally managed to gain the upper hand on the so-called empirical doctors, who cured patients with herbs and natural remedies. In the 1800s, society sanctioned both approaches to healing. Patients had a choice of using either doctors, called allopaths, or natural healers, called empirics or homeopaths. The two groups waged a bitter philosophical debate. The allopathic doctors called their approach heroic medicine. They believed the physician must aggressively drive disease from the body. They based their practice on what they considered scientific theory. The allopaths used three main techniques. They bled the body to drain out the bad humors. They gave huge doses of toxic minerals like mercury and lead to displace the original disease. They also used surgery. But it was a brutal procedure before anesthesia and infection control. Few patients were willing to have surgery. Most patients feared allopathic methods altogether. Satirist of the day remarked that with allopathic treatment, the patient died of the cure. Competing with the doctors were the empiric healers. Contrary to the doctors, they believed in stimulating the body's own defenses to heal itself. Instead of poisonous minerals, they used vegetable products and non-toxic substances in small quantities. They especially favored herbs learned from Native American and old European traditions. The empirics said they based their remedies not on theory, but on observation and experience. Satirists of the day added that with empiric treatment, the patient died of the disease, not the cure. And the balance of medical power remained equal until the turn of the century. Then, new medical treatments emerged that were potentially very profitable. The AMA joined with strong financial forces to transform medicine into an industry. The fortunes of Carnegie, Morgan, and Rockefeller financed surgery, radiation, and synthetic drugs. They were to become the economic foundations of the new medical economy. The takeover of the medical industry was accomplished by the takeover of the medical schools. Well, the people that we're talking about, Rockefeller and Carnegie in particular, came to the picture and said, we will put up money. They offered tremendous amounts of money to the schools that would agree to cooperate with them. The donors said to the schools, we're, we're giving you all this money. Now, would it be too much to ask if we could put some of our people on your board of directors to see that our money is being spent wisely? Almost overnight, all of the major universities received large grants from these sources and also accepted one, two, or three of these people that I mentioned on their board of directors, and the schools literally were taken over by the financial interests that put up the money. Now, what happened as a result of that is that the schools did receive uh, an infusion of money. They were able to build new buildings. They were able to add expensive equipment to their laboratories. They were able to hire top-notch teachers. But at the same time as doing that, they skewed the whole thing in the direction of pharmaceutical drugs. That was the efficiency in philanthropy. The doctors from that point forward in history would be taught pharmaceutical drugs. All of the great teaching institutions in America were captured by the pharmaceutical interests in this fashion. And it's amazing how little money it really took to do it. Surgery became viable with anesthesia and infection control, and doctors advocated expensive radical operations. These in turn produced the need for a large lucrative hospital system. Radium fever swept medicine. The price of radium rose 1,000% almost overnight. Another costly technological industry entered the hospital system. A drug industry grew out of the booming patent medicine business. The doctors changed educational standards and licensing regulations to exclude the empirics. 
Soon, only AMA-approved doctors could legally practice medicine. In a brief 20 years, the AMA came to dominate medical practice. Organized Medicine launched a media campaign to associate the empirics with quacks. The code word for competition was quackery. So now, the average doctor goes through school, he gets a great education, uh, he has to be really smart to get through it, he learns all about drugs, he doesn't know too much about basic nutrition. I found that the average wife of these physicians knows more about nutrition than he does, but they sure know their drugs. And if you go to your typical doctor today, I don't care what it is, chances are you're going to walk out of there with a prescription. Why? Because that's what he has been trained to do. The companies that make up the pharmaceutical industry are among the largest corporations in the world. Together, these businesses have come to be known as Big Pharma. In 2004, their combined global sales were over half a trillion dollars, with Pfizer and Johnson & Johnson leading the pack. In the U.S., the core of Big Pharma's immense profits is from sales of prescription medication. And since these drugs can only be prescribed by medical professionals, most of the industry's promotional and marketing activities are directed at doctors, pharmacists, and other health care providers. This starts out at the first day of medical school, and in many medical schools, uh, even the incoming students that, you know, are two years away from, from, from seeing a patient will start to get gifts from uh, the pharmaceutical industry. And as, um, uh, as these students get farther along in their medical education, the interactions and the gifts escalate to free lunches, to dinners. Champagne, brunches, happy hours, New York jet tickets. No matter where you spend the money, you make money. And my boss always told me, don't worry about it. There's, there'll always be more funding. Spend what you can. In fact, if I give you $100,000 to spend, Gene, I want you to spend 200000 Before 1980, most clinical research was uh, funded by the National Institutes of Health. During the 90s, most of that research got pulled out of universities and uh, was, being done, was brought to uh, for-profit research organizations. The problem is that that gave virtual complete control over the research to the drug companies. They could design the studies. They have control of the data so that ma many of the authors of the most important articles uh, published in our best journals aren't even allowed to see their own data. They don't get free access to their own data. And they have control over publication. To sum it all up, the pharmaceutical industry first gained control of the teaching system. Then it gave the AMA the power to exclude all other doctors from practicing. Then it took over the entire drug testing process while heavily influencing the medical publications that reviewed those drugs. And finally, Big Pharma extended its control over the federal entity that is supposed to verify those drugs' safety and efficacy. At the opposite end are the sick citizens, and in the middle are the doctors who must cure them based on information they can only get from the pharmaceutical industry, which can no longer be verified. Chemotherapy drugs are, in fact, among the most expensive of all. A one-month supply of erlotinib, a chemotherapy drug produced by Roche, costs $2,300. The same supply of serafinib, Bayer's chemotherapy drug, costs $5,500. The monthly supply of sunitinib, a chemotherapy drug produced by Pfizer, cost almost $7,000. The drug industry is the most successful global industry in the world. What they don't want you to do is get better, because if you get better, their market's gone. Thank you.